It's a little bit off uh, off tilt from some of the stuff that you've heard. It, it falls along the same concept lines, but there's two, two things that come into play here. This research and, and this information is all third party work, so it's not work that we have done directly. So I'll, I'll pass that on right off the hop. And the other thing is that it is focusing on winter wheat, and winter wheat's often the, the much maligned crop in, in the West because uh, it seems like it, it'll fluctuate so much. You'll, one year you'll have three quarters of a million acres, the next year you'll have two million acres, and it's just all over the board. Uh, yet there's still kind of an inherent want or need to grow it, but there's also an inherent fear of trying to grow it as well too and, and functionally make it happen. But I found some interesting information uh, from three different sources and some fairly, fairly recent information as well too. Uh, the three trials, and some of you may have seen some of this information in one phase or another at some point in time, but uh, the three parts of this one, that it, or the three trials I was focusing on primarily when I got digging around, uh, was one that was worked that was just done last year in Indian Head uh, with the applied research group there. Uh, one was through AFC, uh, through uh, Lethbridge and Scott, and then the, then the second one was information I gleaned out of North Dakota. So it kept, you know, keeping it in range, yes, it's outside of Canada, but keeping it in into the focus of the areas. And, and in the case of some of the U.S. work, it's I'd say it's more advanced than what we've seen. So just focusing on some of the work that's been done with seed treatments and how they've come into play. Because often seed treatments are, you know, not only is winter wheat at a, at a risk at times, whether anybody wants to grow it, but seed treatments are even stretching it just a little bit farther the other direction because there's a question mark out there, is there value to doing it? The perception is that uh, we don't, we aren't undergoing the warm, wet soils that we can get in the spring sometimes at the time we seed it. And the other thing is what kind of a carry through does it actually impact as it have. So I just want to sh share with you some information. So starting off at Indian Head, um, this was the, kind of an interesting trial. You'll find that the premise of it was similar to uh, the work that you'll see from AFC as well too. Um, they're looking at two basic concepts. Do you treat, do you not treat? And the other uh, side, side by side comparison as well too is the fact that do you go with low seeding rates or a moderate seeding rate, almost exactly the same rate that Kelly was talking about where we're seeding at, or you go to an accelerated seeding rate and what kind of an impact does it have on it? Now, uh, the 400 seeds per square meter for anybody from Ontario is probably a little bit more of a common ground seeding rate down there. Uh, the 200 looks more like ours, it's your bushel and a half an acre sort of a thing. Uh, the seed treatment that was utilized here, we did use uh, Raxel Pro, or, or that was the product that was used. So in theory, using it, and that's where it brings in the Prothioconazole into the mix, as well as the Tepiconazole in, into it too. So we've got the two azoles in there. Now of note, of the one background on this one that continues to surprise everybody, including myself, is the fact that this was seeded in 2012 and never emerged at all in 2012. It didn't actually come out of the ground until 2013. So it was uh, just, it was your typical dry conditions, never took hold. So it really put a different twist on it. And obviously, if you're looking at winter wheat in June 12th and it's at that stage, it obviously pushed it, pushed it back a long ways as well too. But of note, um, on this one, you're looking at um, Braxel Pro treated on the left as opposed to untreated, uh, but going with, the, with that standard, um, or sorry, standard seeding rate that was utilized for it. So, um, definitely s seeing some differences there. Um, kind of the next tier to look at was looking at the treated on the right once you go up to a 400 uh, seed rate. So you're, you're, stand, you're getting more consistency with the stand, but you're also getting a little bit more of, a, of an aggressive stand as well too, and c considering the environment that was operating under. Now, to put it into relative terms, it almost comes down to the, okay, what do we do? Do we just put a lot more seed on and, and forget about seed yeah. treating or do we go with the seeding rates that we're using and look at a treatment? If you look at the two, if you compare them up side by side, you're actually seeing fairly similar stands between, between the two. So it's, it's kind of one or the other in the mix. Now, how did it correlate? Uh, once you get in and dig into these things, uh, the one thing I'll make sure everybody understands is that if we have an untreated here, that represents the average of the, of the 200 and the 400 seeding rate and the same with the treated as well too, so they were pooled together. So a fairly significant difference when you had those averages, uh, sorry, let's go back to that. When you had those averages uh, in place there, um, as far as overall emergence, definitely you saw more plant stand coming in with a seeding rate, and uh, you, know, you, would ex you would expect to see that. NDVIs, uh, uh, Kelly was talking a little bit about that as well too. 
and you do see a differential with the treatment. So you got a little bit more of a robust plant that's coming out of the ground and it is showing more uh, on the ratings on the NDVI to a certain extent as well. Yield, the big one, uh, where does it come into play? So ultimately here, what was shown with the treatment is, yes, we definitely saw an increase in yield, um, but the other thing, the seeding rate was also going there as well too. And the thing I liked about this one is the fact that, you know, if you're going, you maybe you got your seeder, lower seeding rate, but the treatment still takes you at a better starting spot as well too. So it, it's a matter of choosing which practice you feel that you want to follow uh, with these indications, but there is a couple of way, different ways to go, uh, go about it, that's for sure. And then the interactions with the yield, the one thing you don't see with the treatment, you don't see, because it starts at a better point, it doesn't rapidly increase as much, but uh, whereas with seeding rate uh, on the untreated, and that you tend to see, you tend to see it go up a little bit faster, and that's just you're you're buying it up with uh, with more seed in the ground. <coughs> the one other thing that came in here was test weight, and this one's pretty logical uh, to have a, a test weight that does go up um, logically because we saw how the plant stands increased. Typically, anytime you have a plant stand, you got a thicker stand, probably less tillers, more main stem should contribute to the weight a little bit more. And you see that with both, uh, both the events that happened here. So in, in conclusion from that side, the conclusions that were drawn um, by Chris when he was doing this stuff, and I would agree with most of it, is that uh, given this field uh, and this trial situation, it definitely improved establishment uh, a lot by using a seed treatment. So that's something that we haven't necessarily had a lot of substantial information on. Uh, until uh, until you get looking through some of this stuff, as I'd shown before, that lower seeding rate with the treatment was showing pretty parallel with a, with an accelerated seeding rate, and becomes what are the cost way offs to doing that, or the, just the physical process of doing it. And uh, NDBIs, I'd mentioned that we do get an increase in NDBIs. The one thing I, I would temper on this, so you know, seed treatments were bringing the yields up by up 15 percent, uh, doubling the seeding rate was bringing it up 17. The ideal scenario was if you're treating and seeding heavy was increasing over that baseline seed, tree, seed rate and untreated by 37%. I wouldn't run around uh, Bamp Springs and tell everybody in the world you're going to get 15% with your seed treatments all the time or you're going to get 37% because realistically that does not always happen. Good scenario here where you are seeing the increases. That was probably a, a really nice exception, so maybe a little bit higher than you typically see, but uh, no doubt that it definitely, definitely had an impact on it. And as mentioned a little bit about with the, uh, with the test weights. So the other ones I wanted to show you uh, that, I, that I did some looking into, uh, I needed to use a little bit of clarity first, just as you look at a bar graph, and just for clarity on products, because this one's a little bit tricky. Raxel MD and, and, and MDWW, we know those products here. We're familiar with what they are. Uh, the WW, of course, is the stress shield or the emitter that's put in uh, to the mix. Proceed in the U.S. is not the same as Proceed here. Pro we have a product called Proceed in the U.S., but it's not the same one that Syngenta sells here. So two different products there. What Proceed is, it's Raxel Pro is what it is. And then Proceed Plus is Raxel Pro Shield. So it's got the emitter in it. So just a naming difference on them just for clarity. One of the things I wanted to look for, and I just pulled the one slide when it came to survivability, and the one thing I wanted to point out on this one, if you, even if you took a product like a, a Raxel MD in this case, which was in these trials, uh, the thing I liked about that one, or I found really interesting was, uh, in correlation, obviously in correlation to the untreated, we're seeing a bump in stand, um, survivability, and we're also seeing a bump in yield. But I found it kind of interesting, because these, these trials were, they're seated on, they go, all three of these trials that I'll, that I'll show you were, was all using good seed, like good non, not known to be highly diseased seed or anything like that. So we're working off a fairly decent baseline. And the other thing was that there's no known uh, pressures by, by wireworms in particular on this, even though it wasn't, these are all seeded into cereal stubble, um, but no known pressure in there with wireworms. So, as Kelly alluded to, it's never perfect. You never know that absolutely nothing is there. And then, of course, with seed treatments in the soil, you never 100% know what's in the soil and what's going to activate. But that being said, without the presence of uh, wireworms, but by adding the imidacloprid, our stands went up in this case. 
and then so did the uh, so did the yields as well too. So found that kind of interesting. Now to look at some of the uh, the general trials that were out in the field, there I have two different ones to show you. This is three years with five locations in North Dakota. And I show you this one because it did not have the Pro Seed or the, the Raxel Pro in it. Um, but I did, I did note on these ones too over those years that there was, following that same trend line, um, they were showing some increases in, in uh, yield when you're going up to the, and putting the stress yield in the mix, which once again I found kind of interesting. You know, it's not like it's, gonna, it's tacking on 15 bushels an acre, but w why, is, why is the yield increasing? It just it, it just kind of begs to begs to offer some more maybe more questions than answers. But and then if we take it over a more condensed one, when you bring the the uh, Pro Shield um, and the and the just the Raxel Pro into the mix, also a similar trend line. So if you look at the MD and the MD with the Stress Shield, you look at the uh, the Raxel Pro and then adding the Stress Shield, it had the same effect fact with both of them where it seems to jump it up and like I said it's it's hard to say hundred percent why why are we picking up those you know those extra two two and a half bushels in these cases and that's just I just graph is the same is very similar here but it's just a little bit probably easier to to visualize what uh, what's going on so that there's no doubt definite improvements over the untreated which kind of you know from an overall agronomic and recommendation standpoint it looks like the seed treatments are definitely bringing something to the table with winter wheat, but depending which one you use might also be bringing varying uh, influence as well too as to how the yield and the stands come in. So number three I wanted to show you um, it was, uh, was this, the work that was done. And this one was kind of, this trial was very similar in concept in a lot of ways to the work that was done in Indian Head. The one difference with it was the fact that they introduced one other um, I guess you could say variable to it. So not only the seeding rates were the same, 200, meter, 200 per meter squared, 400 per meter squared, but the other factor that was introduced was also having a poorer seed lot in the sense of a, a thin seed, so not a real plump seed, just to see if that had any effect on the energy in the establishment. So in this case, uh, we we're seeing some similar, the, the visuals are fairly similar on this. So you got your weak agronomic system. So in this scenario up here, um, you're seeding at a low rate, you're seeding with skinny seed and you're not treating. You're taking that same low rate and skinny seed but throwing in a fungicide into the mix and in this case this was a, the equivalent of a Raxel WW so it did have the midacloprid in the mix as well too. If you go to the high end system or if you want to say the, the, the big seeding rate and with the heavy seed, pretty obvious the stands are better than up, up at least up in there for sure. But we're still seeing a pretty good establishment with the uh, with the seed treatment uh, on the uh, on the right as well too here. So it it seems to be enhancing it a certain amount on the visuals. How did that equate back when we were looking at uh, the actual data with it? Um, the dual treated and that's that's the uh, Raxel WW. Uh, fall densities were up somewhat. Uh, spring densities were up somewhat. We did see a yield bump, but uh, you'll note with this one too following along some of that same lines as the stuff from Indian Head, when we're at that light seeding rate, you could say the yield increase was significant moving across, uh, but of 400, not so much. I mean, that's not a significant difference in there. So the heavier seeding rates um, with a treatment versus a check was, was fairly comparable in this case. It was, it was more impactful if you were going with more of a, 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 an industry rate, I guess you could say. One of the takeaways from this one uh, that I noticed because anytime you do this like you can get the big numbers but you can also look and see how consistent the numbers are within it and just to try to simplify what this one is what we're getting at with this one is is really two zones that are of interest here this is the one this is an area where you'll have a high mean yield and consistency to go with it so not nearly as much uh, variability and this is kind of your worst case scenario when you're looking at not only a low mean yield, but also a lot of variability to go with it as well too. So ultimately, you don't wanna be down there and you wanna be up here. And the questions are, so what gets us up there given the whole regime of uh, you know of this trial? And yes, the seed treatments were definitely a part of it, 
but also you can see having a good plump seed with, uh, with a treatment works very good. We had a high seeding rate, you're up there. Um, even without having a big high seeding rate keeps you up there as well too. So there's no doubt higher seeding rates can help compensate as well too. Um, but having a, you know, a good seed, having a treatment, and at that standard rate, very, very consistent results came out of it as well too. So different, different ways you can, you, can, you can interpret that. And no big shocker, skinny seed, low seeding rate, no treatment was not, not on a consistent basis. So uh, just a couple of other things I wanted to mention to this, and then I probably don't have to, uh, you know, to carry on too long about it. The other part of this one was there was treatments that were done in this trial where straight tebiconazole was used, straight metal axyl was used, imidacloprid by itself was used, and then the combination of the three into this mix here. So not, there was an increase with imidacloprid by itself, but judging by the stats on that, you couldn't call it significant. Even though there is an increase, you couldn't necessarily call that significant, not based, not based on that number there. It's when you had the combinations that you were getting to more of a significant yield increase on it. So it looks like you almost still have to have the two pieces of the puzzle. You wouldn't, you wouldn't run home and just put a bunch of stress yield by it, just by itself, and which wouldn't be a good practice anyway, because we know there's more than one thing that goes on in a field on a given day. But that combination did, did show a bit better on it. Uh, the only other one I was gonna show you quickly on here was um, as another part of that study, like another section to that study, was looking at seed treatments uh, with the use of a foliar fungicide as well too. And that could, that could stir up a whole lot of questions that we maybe don't have the answers to at this point in time. But I think the, the interesting thing I found about this one, it's the same concept as that other chart. And actually some of the most consistent yields coming out were, was using a foliar and the, using something like even a straight tebiconazole or a straight imidacloprid in conjunction with the foliar fungicide was your most consistent. Um, practice to use. Maybe not a big surprise because I think most people are familiar with winter wheat. It is something that does benefit from a foliar fungicide no matter what the scenario. It's just what are, it just begs to the question, all this work as to what are we missing out on if we aren't seed treating because typically it's just, yeah, it's just not a practice that's done that much. So it, it gets a lot of food for thought. The overall summary that came out of this work and I would agree with it, um, I think anytime you're under, like it, it can only do so much work with it, you can only control so many variables, but if anytime you're faced with a poorer seed lot, um, or if you're just planning on seeding at a scheduled seeding rate, that's, you're not gonna change it, that's all the seed you got, and that's as good as it's gonna get. Uh, seed treatment does definitely seem to have, provide a benefit based on, on the different studies that I've looked at. And, um, but the, you can't, the thing is you can't take into consideration, and it's tough to measure the other things like, the seed not germinating in 2012 and not coming up to 2013. How dry is it in the fall? How dry is it in the spring? All the things that, got, that have fears uh, for growing winter wheat, but there may be some things that we can do to, to work on that and mitigate some of, those, uh, some of those stress factors that come in as well too. So 